We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. starting this podcast with an absolute treat you are going to dive into the infamous not infamous but overlooked breakup story oh, you went to visit yeah. this chick's parents for christmas thanks and thanksgiving and were broken up with her before valentine's day if not far before you were broken up there in like christmas i was just saying it, was, it happened at the uh, right before new year's she got us both sweaters mike she didn't get us both she sweaters. was a part of the pod she was i mean objectively like an incredible person. She was great. Like it was not anything to do with her whatsoever. It was just at this point in my life, like I can see when things aren't working out in a relationship and it's better to not try to force it than to continue going down that path. That's how bad things end up happening. Now I don't think anything bad is going to happen. Like she was probably the most genuine person I've ever met, but like that was almost part of the problem because I'm, she couldn't like fathom that I'm still like a very, good person but i'm just like a dumbass at my core they're like i do dumb shit but it's not malicious mm -hmm. like i just you know yeah i, I know. do dumb shit <laughs> like the rest story some other stories that we'll probably get to over the course of the spring that just like i can't explain why but that's been that's th i got three decades of that on tape mm -hmm. i'm not going to change my stripes at this point if we're like yeah. talking about a prospect i'm a like I, at my core i'm a dumbass so that's that's that uh that was part of the inspiration behind dry january let's try to like reset mm -hmm. and did some soul searching i feel like i've come to realize that i only do a few things in life like having not drank all last month like all i do is fo watch football play golf and work out like i don't do anything else i don't watch tv shows i don't watch movies like i, I don't have other hobbies i don't even read books like if i'm reading a book <laughs> it's about football so like in a girlfriend i need someone who's going to be mash my energy in one of those areas mm -hmm. like or else it's just not going to you didn't mention drink in that yeah well that's because dry january oh sorry sorry but that's like that would be four miller light would be four mm -hmm. and i hope she she wouldn't match my energy for miller light that you would be you, no one can i yeah, can't that, that would be tough um so the, the drawing board those that's gonna have to be one a on my yeah. you know next girlfriend list do we need to get dr phil on the podcast we could. we could some i do need some sort of psychological help that sounds sure. like it man. like i'm not i'm not open up this can of worms like, here. I, like, I, I, I said the other day i pride myself on my normalcy i don't think you like get a job in football having not played football in high school because you didn't have it or college mm -hmm. being normal like yeah. it just doesn't happen i did math competitions on the weekends growing up so i'm not norm normal. wow wow I was expecting some level of horror story, but it just sounds like things weren't working out. You know, that's just out, that's so. life, man. Don't worry about it, dude. I still love the sweater. I still wear the sweater every night. Actually. I mean, not every night, but you know, most nights. Uh, but no, that's that's uh, unfortunate. But we move on. We march on. You know, yeah. I've tried to match your energy in better lights a handful of times. It never works want out. I can maybe get to fifty percent before I go downhill. Um, <clears throat> So let's go ahead and get into this all prospect team, all PFF prospect team. So walk me through the basis of this piece and uh, what exactly you're going for. Let's say we got a little lull in the action here, draft action before Absolutely. Friday, big day, 10 a.m. I'll be live tweeting it, Trevor Lawrence Pro Day. That's we'll finally get to know if he's good. Well, yeah, that, that's going to sway my decision on if he's better or worse than Patrick Mahomes. I mean, he throws a couple inaccurate balls. I'm dropping him to UDFA. That's my take. You know, I, Is he going to match Johnny Manziel's? Johnny Manziel had the best pro day ever. Is Can he wearing gloves or is he not wearing gloves? Yeah. Is he throwing to his guys? I don't know. Like, this is going to be all factors here. I, I just want to see what the hair looks like. But, so low on the action. So, I, all PFF era team, this is every position, the best prospect. We've been doing this seven years. We started grading 2014. That was the Jameis Winston, Marcus Mariota draft. Every single position, who is the best single prospect we've graded 
and been the highest on at those respective positions. Not who turned out the best. This isn't revisionist history. I'm not going to say Justin Jefferson was a top wide receiver prospect for us. He wasn't. Hand up. We fucked up. These are the guys we were. And I feel like a majority, there's only a few who made like honorable mention that really haven't necessarily lived up to the hype. We'll get to those, though. Let's dive in. I wouldn't say we fucked up with Justin Jefferson. Okay, yeah, he was like 30th on our board. I, and I still he think that 22nd. situation matters and development matters. Yeah. And like I, I said, I tweeted this a while ago, and I'm bringing it up again. Draft up evaluation to the point where it is now from a media perspective is so overvalued and overrated, in my opinion, from a media perspective. Like people are like, this player is better than this player, and I will go and die on this hill until and, and I will not take any other suggestions. Yeah. That is not what draft evaluation is. There's a range of outcomes for every single player. Justin Jefferson's range of outcomes included being very, very good. Yeah. I, I think at the beginning when I first started doing draft stuff, I was like, the ranking is what matters. Yes. The getting it right is what matters. And I've transitioned to telling you who a guy is is what matters. Yes. Telling you where they fit in in an NFL team is what matters. Because that, that like, being able to tell you, like, this guy is not going to be a fit for your team, and then he goes there and, and doesn't play well, like, that – that's what I think is matters. They're telling you a guy is a project and maybe three years down the road he's going to be good, but right away, don't expect too much. Like that to me yes. is I think what- No one said that about Justin I, Jefferson. No yeah. one said he was a project that in no, two yeah. or three years time he'd be good. They said, just this know. is where he wins now. Yeah. And he has a very good chance of being successful in these same situations in 2020. And he did. And he proved after not seeing a ton of, a ton of press coverage at LSU, working against press in the NFL, that he does have that ability to do it at the yeah, big Yeah, like leagues. we said, and, he's incredible at the catch point. And I think that's why I, I'm going to applaud you again for what you said, I think, a couple episodes ago when you said, what was the biggest thing you learned this past draft season? And you said, just because you haven't seen it from a guy doesn't mean he can't do it. Go and find that's out. What, yeah, you know. go find out if he can. And I think that's where the benefit of the NFL team, the, the NFL teams have private workout opportunities. They have extended interview opportunities. I think you can find out more than we can based on just film, yeah. some interviews, and obviously the data analysis that we have. But like, you are not getting to the level of detail that NFL teams are, especially with those private workouts. I think those can't get understated. There's a reason the NFL only allows you to do 30. You know, like you're you're not like you're not allowed to do that with every single player, or else you would. And um, yeah. I think with Justin Jefferson and some other players as well, it's like, hey, we never saw him do it at the collegiate level, so it's not necessarily a positive for him yet, and holding us back from an evaluation standpoint. But if he does do it in the NFL and does exceed expectations, don't be surprised. Yeah. All right, now let's jump to this all prospect team. I'm going to read them, and uh, we'll go from there. Quarterback. Yeah. Trevor Lawrence of Clemson with Starter. the honorable mention of Joe Burrow, LSU. Yeah, the harder one here, I think we've touched on it, was the honorable mention. Who to put in that slot. We love Baker Mayfield coming out. Loves Kyler. Three straight years. I think he had two of the 10 highest graded seasons or two of the five highest graded seasons, excuse me, Baker Mayfield at the quarterback position. Loved him coming out. I think we liked him more than Kyler. Kyler had the one year only. Not as accurate as Baker in terms of the charting numbers. And then we also love Zach Wilson. This, what he did this past year on tape was, I mean, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Now, it, the level of competition makes it hard to really go to bat Zach Wilson, but like tools perspective, he's all there. Baker Mayfield like has a cannon too. Obviously, we saw him throw 70 plus yards, but still went Joe Burrow here because I think the poise, the NFL offense, the competition he did it against, and the level of accuracy, like all those things combined, there was not a path for Joe Burrow failing in the NFL, in my opinion. There's a path for Baker Mayfield failing. Like he played behind ridiculous offensive line, never under pressure, didn't have good and necessarily still, pocket his presence. His pocket presence was, was, good. was his biggest thing, was his biggest issue even back then. And so Burrow, though, is just like he had the highest floor of any of those guys after Trevor Lawrence, in my opinion. Smallest hands, too. Smallest hands, dude. You got to yeah. bring up hand size. Quinn's big on hand size. What were Baker's hands? I don't remember. I need to look this up now. We got to find it out. Got to find it out. The other thing I'll mention too is I wish when you mentioned Baker Mayfield throwing 70 plus yards, anytime someone gets to that number for a quarterback, I always think of Jamarcus Russell because he could throw 40 yards on his butt, 60 yards on his knees, and 80 yards standing. And that's when Al Davis drilled and drafted number one overall. I would love if Neil Hornsby is listening, the uh, oh, uh, founder of PFF, for an offseason project for us to go back and grade Great his Jamarcus. LSU games. Because I think... It would be awesome to see the cannon, mm -hmm. and but also I bet you you don't, you find a lot of inaccuracies on his tape and that thing. I don't even know if you do, because like again, it's hard to read into. Like I, I don't like reading into one guy as like a trend or whatever of mm -hmm. what to draft a position. We heard the stories of Bruce Gratkowski. He didn't work at all. Yeah, 
Like he, he had he no. He was an outlier interest. from a work ethic perspective. Yes, he had no interest in actually studying the game of football. Same with like Johnny Menzel. Like Johnny mm-hmm. Menzel, like you can make the Zach Wilson Johnny Menzel comp. That doesn't mean Zach Wilson is going to be a piece of shit. Johnny Menzel didn't he didn't do anything when he got his work NFL. ethic off the field develop. was high though at parties. Like that guy was grinding. You know that guy went more parties than Marcus active. Russell. He was active. The ring with Jamarcus Russell, Russell. He was lazy. He inactive. wasn't at the parties. Yeah. He was at home snacking. Baker um, Mayfield nine and a quarter. Have we told the Bruce Gretkowski story on the pod? About yeah, him? So. Yeah, I think so. I'll bring it up just lightly again. But Bruce Gretkowski said when he was working with the Raiders, working with, he was a quarterback for the Raiders. <laughs> they said the only way, because everyone has heard the Kirk Morrison story, shout out San Diego State, where they the coaches gave Jamarcus Russell a tape to review before practice the next day. The tape was blank. But when he came in the next day, he said, hey, what'd you see? And he's like, oh, I saw this, this, and this. So he lied to them and didn't actually review the tape. The other story is from Bruce Gretkowski, where he said um, the only way to get him to watch tape was to bring... Burger King or Wendy's? I think it was Wendy's. Wendy's Burgers. They said they grabbed like 10, 12 burgers. That, him and one of them accounts. I think it was the other, one of them accounts was with him. I don't remember. But they'd go to his house. He's laying in his big ass bed and they'd give him the burgers and watch next to him in a bed. They're sitting in chairs. He said they were sitting in chairs and he's laying his ass down in bed. Is that not absurd? Like that in and of itself is a red flag. But Odin's a hell of a drug. I wanted to bring this up because it's we're we're on the conversation of evaluating talent and and seeing how they progress. You know, a lot has been made of how successful the Tampa Bay Buccaneers have been drafting of late. And like with the hits they've had in the secondary, yeah. even with Vita Vea, Devin White playing well, all this stuff. I will say this. They have done a successful job drafting. I also think so much of that is coaching development and that th- and those things. I don't think they got to a point where like we're just we can't miss. I think they're doing a very good job of putting these players in a position to succeed and developing their talents. Like I I think Do a you? lot of that is development. I I think like Tristan Wirfs it didn't matter where he went. No, no. Okay, some of the prospects are different. Andrew but like Winfield didn't matter where he went. I don't know. And they picked like three man, good man corners. Like they, they picked guys with a certain skill set. Again, like they picked, yeah, like guys with a man skill set to play blitz man match them back end. Like that, it was, they married it well. I, like it's not just one or the other in my opinion. Fair enough. All they right. also drafted a kicker in the second round. They learned their lesson after that. True. Who actually, if we did, if we did in all, uh, Aguayo might make the team. He'd be honorable mention, actually. Uh, who was the other guy? Uh, a, Catanzaro. Yeah, Catanz- He would have been the he would have been the guy there. So guy. Running back, you have Dalvin Cook as the main feature piece here, and then the honorable mention is Saquon Barkley of Penn State. Yeah, I, I think Cook obviously fell the second round not because of talent. You remember when FSU took two team pictures that one year with Cook? I don't remember that. You don't remember that? They took two team pictures, one with him and one without him, because that's how like bad his off-field issues were at Florida oh State. No, God. no, like, actual crimes committed. Didn't he honest, also, like, not like, have a good combine? Yeah. It, well, per him. Mm-hmm. It was still around a 4-5. Yeah, yeah. But people were like, this guy's 4-3. And honestly, he was. And, like, he went on sports science. That was... Uh, I remember watching pre-draft. He goes on sports science, and he had, like, the fastest standstill 20-yard split they've, like, ever tracked. They, like, had all these running backs come in for the past decade or whatever. And just from standing, he was the fastest, like... But he just, like, didn't have a... Didn't, probably necessarily prepared to actually run a 40 and so he ran like a four or five not great testing numbers but like you go back and watch his tape he was the best single runner now didn't do much as a receiver at lsu but like he played behind dog shit offensive lines at 4.2 yards after contact per attempt on 6.1 yards per carry which is an insane rate like insane ratio of yards after contact per uh two yards per carry and w- was just no one caught him on his tape at FSU and was like ideal size. He, he was, in my opinion, a better pure runner than Saquon Barkley. Barkley was a freak in his own right, though. Don't get twisted. This one blows me away. This this wide receiver piece here. You have Jamar Chase, then Amari Cooper, and then oh. the honorable mentions are Ceedee Lamb and Devontae Smith. I didn't put those necessarily in order, but okay. Cooper. I think pe- people sleep on how not sleep, but like I think it's easy to forget how ridiculous Cooper was in his own right. Back in Alabama, he was like their passing off. He had 124 catches. Lane Kiffin was in his bag yards. with Amari Cooper too. Like yeah. he used him to his absolute peak. Yeah, it was incredible. He was Devontae Smith before Devontae Smith, without like passing the advent of modern passing offenses either. So mm-hmm. like he was insane. The only thing was like some focus drops. That's obviously continuing in the league. Oh well. So, uh, but Jamar Chase. Also on this list, just like what he did at 19 years old with an NFL body with 
the physicality, it's only going to get better. You know, he's only like we didn't get to see it, but you can assume some sort of physical improvement over the course of his college career. So those are one and two to me. And then Lamb and Devontae Smith, like pretty self-explanatory there. There was a there was a lull where there wasn't great talent. Honestly, the closest guy to me from that like kind of stretch where it was just like oh, no first round wide receiver hit for a long time was uh John Ross. And that's because we didn't realize he was a big uh Moron. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, should we tell the John Ross story? I can't we can't tell the we John Ross. I think John it's kind of rude, right? I don't know. He's still in the league, is the thing. Like you okay. can tell the Mar- Jamarcus Russell stuff. He's not in the league. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got I'm a, surprised okay, just, that C Lamb we got a and John Ross Smith. story for whenever he retires. Jerry Judy was the top receiver. How is Jerry Judy not an honorable mention? He's a slot receiver. Okay. Fair enough. Look at the next one. Oh, you have slot receiver next. I cheated. <laughs> I apologize. I will say this about uh Coop too. People forget in that draft class, there was legitimate conversation between Cooper and Kevin White of West Virginia. Oh yeah. You remember that? DJ had Kevin White. Really? Yeah. Oh, buddy. I remember like I was a big Raiders fan at the time. I mean, I was still a Raiders fan technically, but like I was like, dude, if we pick Kevin White over Mari Cooper, I will lose my mind. I I this is not what we do. You know, yeah. it's former cuz Kevin White had all of this like former Juco, only one year of really good production, not going to be as fast as Mari Cooper, all this stuff and it's like, dude, we have to take Coop. He anyway, 437 Kevin White, he was a he he was like because he was a freak of nature. That's why there were people yeah, fell in yeah, love yeah. with him. But he was just he was the classic like ran two routes at West Virginia. Fair guy. enough. Slot receiver, you have Jerry Judy of Alabama, and then number two is Alabama's Jalen, Jalen Waddle. Uh, wh- that, wide receiver that, factory. Yeah, that's how good these last two wide receiver classes are. We had five guys in the last two years among our top eight prospects each year. Like this, th- these don't come around all the time. It's like, because they recruit so well. Yeah, I mean, like you're, but, this isn't like Alabama. And I, I think Alabama does a good job of developing talent. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they also get like every best. five-star wide receiver recruit out. Yeah. You know, if you are a five-star wide receiver recruit, you get an offer from Bama. And you have to make the choice of whether or not you want to go there or Ohio State or Michigan or whatever. You are getting one, though. And I think the Alabama continues to just rip it up with that. Yeah. Where would you go if you were – What? so you are what, DN coming out? I was a, I was also a guard, but probably D-end better guard? defensive end. D D end right now. Where are you going? Dude, I'm going to Michigan. I think Michigan would be sick. You want to go to Michigan? Dude, they do a good job at Michigan. Fuck you. Or right. or I mean, so from like develop me the best, and I want to get drafted highly, Michigan. If I want like, to have the best just, college time of my life. That's what I'm saying. Probably gonna go. Like you're, you're there for fun and to like make money in the future. Yeah, yeah, but like yeah, it's yeah. four years you don't get. Maybe back I three go years. USC or UCLA because I mean the, the weather just is. Try to dig a knife into me. I'll be honest. Okay, I wouldn't if I was. I think my physical skill set, safety, probably would have been where okay. I end up. Um, Clemson would be kind of sick. tough. I, I got in, like the one thing I regret about going to Notre Dame: cold as hell. You, no one tells you that it's like it never. You're not in school. The only time it's warm. Clemson would be sweet. I, I'd probably go to man. I. Arizona or Arizona State too. Like I know they're Pac-12, but like those schools fucking rage. This is a very regional question too, because yeah. like Austin, you're a West Coast guy, so you default to like USC, UCLA. Mm-hmm. But like if you're from the Midwest, like Ohio State, you guys yeah, have been yeah. to Columbus. Ohio like, State's insane. Ohio, Ohio State, State would be Columbus insane. is cool. Is they like develop the players. Yeah, that'd be good, dude. Also though, weird. like I know West Coast bias here, but Washington, which is based in Seattle and has like a sick location, I, I you're could a be Seattle guy. I can see. You I love Seattle. Seattle dude. Portland guy too. The coffee the in Seattle is fucking awesome. Uh, I wish I could go back. Okay. Uh, my decision. We got to get off this. I'd go to the U. Okay. The U? I'd go to That's Miami. dope. I actually is kind of dope. I'll join you. Um, okay, cool. So that slot receiver, Jerry Judy, and then Jalen Waddle as the honorable mention. Tight end here. A lot in this class. Kyle Pitts of Florida at tight end. And then number two is OJ Howard of Alabama. Yeah. A lot offensively in this class. We're going to get to defense to see. Hey, not as much. But yeah, Kyle Pitts, this one's not a hot take. The O.J. Howard one is one that I think, in retrospect, may be overrated. Like, he just was not a dyn- – he was fast, not dynamic. He was not agile, not offering much else in that regard. But Kyle Pitts is different, man. That, that guy is dynamic. Yeah. He can move, and he can win from anywhere. So – I think how we're evaluating tight ends, though, has changed a lot since O.J. Yeah. Howard's class. Yeah. I mean, like, you are looking for a legit dynamic athlete. Like you said, you're looking for a Kyle Pitts, a Travis yeah. Kelsey, a Kittle, a Waller. That's how you win with a tight end in the NFL now. While back in the day, it's like you're looking for this, like, multidimensional, productive 
blocking yeah. tight that catches everything like a Heath yeah. Miller type. You're looking yeah. for like a Zach Miller, Heath Miller guy. When now it's like, I want a guy that can go deep. <laughs> I want a guy who can run in the slot, run out wide and, and do these different things. So I think the, that is another part of it as well. All right, offensive tackle. Laramie Tunsil of Ole Miss, pre-gas mask. Panay Sewell of Oregon. And then the honorable mentions are Jonah Williams of Alabama. Love Jonah Williams. And then Leo Collins of LSU. That's pre... He had some stuff before the draft that broke down to where he went undrafted yeah, free his agent. Girlfriend, ex girlfriend got murdered or whatever that was. Oh, that's right. And then that was they didn't brutal. know. That was really bad for him. That was that was unfortunate, obviously, for her too. Um, but Laramie Tonsil, he was like had it all, the athleticism, the length. <laughs> Injury shortened year, but he still earned a ninety one point one overall grade his final year at Ole Miss. We we're just like, Yeah, Laramie Tonsil's gonna be good. maybe not right away. He's going to be good. Penny Sewell. He was the original dancing bear, right? Everyone was calling Laramie Tunsil. That was when I yeah. first heard the scouting term take off. It was like Laramie Tunsil, the dancing bear. That's what everyone called Don't go Google searching dancing bear, by the way. Sorry. But, uh, but Penny Sewell, enough said there. It's more the honorable mention here is more interesting part because you got Andrew Thomas in the mix. We were super high, and I'm sure some worse. We are like, they were 1A, 1B. They were, I think, a spot up behind each, each other on our draft board. Those guys were in the mix for the top tackle prospect. We also love Jack Conklin coming out when he was a prospect. But I think Lyle Collins is our first year, and we're like, this guy is an absolute stud. He allowed four pressures all season long at LSU. Now it's a super run-heavy offense, but we're just like, that guy's going to be good. Jonah Williams, the the notes on the opposing love prospects, the notes, was guy. not the physical freak by any means. Did not have that. But three years, right tackle, left tackle, Graded really well in the SEC. We're just like he started as a true floor. freshman, right? Yeah. Like he started was doing it as right a tackle. true freshman in the SEC and getting it done. I, I, Jonah Williams's production at that position in the SEC was like what really set him apart. You know, it wasn't the arm length, it wasn't the athleticism. It was like, oh my god, this guy has just been doing it at a very good level against NFL competition yeah. for three years. Like some of these guards we're about to mention. All right, offensive guard, you have Quentin Nelson of Notre Dame, and then you have Rashawn Slater of Northwestern, who's in this year's class. And yes. then honorable mentions are Cody Whitehair and of Kansas State and then Isaiah Wynn of Georgia. Yeah, only one of these guys actually played guard in the college. Mm -hmm. Quentin Nelson, the only one who played guard. Self-explanatory there. Everyone and their mother was high on Quentin Nelson coming out. Rashawn Slater, again, as tackle, I'm not putting him in close to that conversation at the top but like this guy at guard you put him in his own heavy scheme guard like this is easy money he is but you want teams to play him at tackle first right like you're not saying yeah. guard first yeah. yes you play him at tackle first but like he's not that level of prospect as a pure tackle like the arm length showed up the guy who gave him the most fits aj epinesa it's like 34 inch arms mm -hmm. that's like and he i think had like four pressures against him in that game in 2019 so it it, it does matter to a degree. You can overcome it, but you're just not going to be, like I said, on that level that those guys were at the top of the class. Cody Whitehair absolutely loved. He was a four years, graded exceptionally well. We said another guy, you can keep him at tackle, but then he's turned out to be a good center slash guard in the NFL. And Isaiah Wynn, they actually kept at tackle. One of the few. We he's didn't played expect well. that, and he's been very good at tackle, too. All right, center. He, was, he actually, I think, had somewhat long arms, but was just short. 6'3 or something. I got to look this one up. I need to. I need to know these arm lengths. This is my Come job, on, dude. What are you doing, man? <sighs> Fuck. All right, Fra center. We have Frank Ragnow of Arkansas, the guy that three and three days. So solid. Yeah. Frank Ragnow of Arkansas, the guy that Cincinnati Bengals faithful, including Mac Mike Quinn, wish they grabbed. Instead, yeah. they grabbed Billy Price, just one pick later. And then honorable mention is Elton Jenkins, Mississippi State. Your guy. Yeah. Your guy. We know how to fucking evaluate centers. That's what I'll. That's all I'll say. Ragnow. He was awesome, man. You watched him against Alabama. And so my favorite thing was his senior year. Plays Alabama. Plays guard in that game. Dominated Alabama. He played center as like majority of his career. I think he started his freshman year at guard. Two years at center. And then just switches there in, in a, for one game because someone else got hurt. And just dominates. And then Elkton Jenkins. It wasn't just that he played center that were super high in him. It's like this guy played right tackle, left tackle, left guard, and center at some point in his college career. And was Good in pass protection, every single one. Was he the best run blocker? No. But he had some of the best balance I've ever seen from an offensive lineman. It's like that 
he's done the exact same thing with the Packers. What do they call it in baseball where you hit every single type of hit? Cycle. Hit the cycle. We need something for if you play every position Ooh. along the offensive line. Yeah. Hitting the cycle, the, the proverbial cycle. Um, but it's something when you bring up like playing all these different positions. I talked to Quinn Miners recently. That interview will play on, I think, either the Thursday episode or the Monday episode of Two for One Drafts. Uh, he said the night before, the night before he went to the senior bowl, the coach called the offensive line coach called him and said, Hey, we're gonna play at center. He had really never played center. He mostly played guard his entire, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, Wisconsin Whitewater career. And then he said, okay, and was learning a new position on the fly, learning to snap and all of those things on the fly and still dominated down there in, in the senior bowl. And then also I brought up the injury. I'm, I'm, I'm giving away some of the interview here, but I encourage you to listen to the full thing. You know how Ian Rapport tweeted out that Quinn Miners was like battling the play after breaking his hand. Mm-hmm. He said that like, Brian Flores was just like, absolutely not. We're not playing in this game. We don't want you to re-injure it, all this stuff. And he was like trying to get in for a couple snaps. But then Brian Flores said, or Quinn Myers convinced him, he's like, hey, if we're winning and we do like a victory formation, can I get in for a couple snaps? And he said, yeah. And he got in at the back end of the game, which I thought was cool. Um, all right. Nose tackle. Quinn and Williams of Alabama with the honorable mention being the Super Bowl winning Vita Vea of Washington. Yeah. Quinnen was, there's a reason why top three is a guy. And, and now... I think it was he wasn't even like a pure nose tackle as a prospect and hasn't really necessarily been in the nfl but that's where he played at alabama that's where he was dominating 96.5 run defense grade as a red shirt sophomore still the highest we've ever seen but i think vita vea is the other guy where it's just like 6'4 347 94.7 run defense grade his final year at washington we're just like this guy's gonna be a fucking horse mm-hmm. in run defense and, and the difference between him and Danny Shelton. Yeah, I was about to say. Danny Shelton graded out really well, went to Washington. Danny Shelton ran a 5.64 at the Combine. Danny Shelton was not an elite athlete. He was a chonk who could manhandle college centers. Vita Vea ran a 5.1. Different caliber of athlete altogether to where, and that's why like it matters when a guy is 23 years old. And Vita Vea, I think, was a senior coming out of Richard Senior. When the guy's on the older side, he's physically dominant. To know that, like, the testing matters because to know that will translate to the NFL, the physical dominance. Oh, yeah, he is actually a physical freak, whereas Dan Shelton gets drafted in the first round, but just, like, was not that level of explosiveness for that to continue. And now he was fine in run defense over the course of his career, but it never translated as a pass rusher. Via Vea, it has translated also as a pass rusher. Yeah, I remember when he was coming out, I mean, it was the constant comparison to him between Shelton, him and Shelton. What's the difference? And Via Vea was obviously... Because you also saw Vita Vea, I think, show up as a pass rusher a lot more than you did with Shelton. Like, Vita Vea was winning early in the snap as a pass rusher, and you even still see that in the NFL now. Uh, three tech. They Maurice still should have went Derwin James, though. I still maintain... What'd you say? They still should have went to Erwin James, the Bucks. Fair enough. All right, three tech, Maurice Hurst of Michigan, and then you also have the honorable mention being Jonathan Allen of Alabama. A ton of Bama kids on this list. No surprises. Yeah, uh, we love both these guys, man. I think they were both top three on yeah, our board. Yeah, I think Hurst was three. And I think Jonathan Allen was three that year with Derek Barnett and Miles Garrett ahead of him. But Hurst was play for play, snap for snap, the highest graded defensive tackle we've ever seen. He was utterly unblockable at Michigan. And he's a guy where comes in 291 pounds, did not have that level of explosiveness, did not test great. And so he has not been as dominant as we thought he would be in the NFL. And in retrospect, looking back, I probably would have been lower, like just The testing, testing. was bad. I mean, yeah. like for what we wanted Taking him that to testing be. Into because account I think more. the counter to his size cons or people who size doubters were like oh you've seen Aaron Donald have success you've seen yes. Kenny Clark have success but there be, wasn't as big of a counter to his athleticism okay. concerns yes. and yes. that was where again like you said testing matters like is this going to translate yes or no yes and so I mean he's been good in the NFL he had like 78 something pass rushing grade has dealt with some injuries and had that heart condition or whatever that ended up ultimately dropping him in the draft but man 94.4 grade as a senior, 90.2 as a junior, 88.6 as a sophomore. Like he just every single year was balling out there. I think I think you're smart though with that hindsight analysis to think about his athleticism a little bit more and potentially drop him down boards yeah, if you're like doing it again. Smaller on the smaller end, you better be better have the plus, choose. You better be a plus athlete. Yeah. And he was just like he was fine. Like he wasn't unathletic for didn't test out unathletic for a defense tackle by any means. But he was not like he was not Aaron Donald. I, I think he had something like a five four nine eight forty. That's not Aaron Donald. That's that's fine for yeah. a DT. But when you're two hundred ninety pounds, you got to be a little bit more than that. 
All right, uh, Edge of Chase Young of Ohio State and then Miles Garrett of Texas A&M. And then after that, two more OSU guys, also brothers, Nick Bosa and Joey Bosa as honorable mentions. Yes. Now, Garrett Garrett had a 92.1 pass rush grade as a true freshman at Texas A&M. He was... Murdering kids. Yes. And the thing is, Chase Young, like, didn't. He was not... Freshman, sophomore year, he was good. He was not that. Like, Miles Garrett, everyone just knew. It's like, okay, Miles Garrett's different. Three straight years of that. Obviously, number one overall pick. Chase Young took a little bit more, but like those guys had all of it that, like, no question marks. You're, you're, not, you weren't, you're not questioning Chase Young or Miles Garrett if they're going to translate to the NFL. People had question marks about Joey Bosa. And I think if Nick Bosa would have been first, they would have had question marks about him too, because they're not that the freaks that Chase Young and Miles Garrett are from an explosiveness standpoint. That's not necessarily how they win, but. We didn't necessarily have those concerns. We're like, th- this, the way they win, they don't need that level of juice. They have bend, they have power, their upper bodies. Like, those guys are going to The bigger be concerns for us with the Bosa brothers were injuries, right? I mean, and that's then, what we yeah. brought up. Like, Nick Bosa didn't play a ton, yeah. you know, going into that draft. He didn't have a ton of snaps compared to Joey. Joey and both didn't of them. have injuries in his career, though, I don't think. Oh, really? Yeah. Nick. The Twitter counts, too. Oh, that's true. And the way they walk. The way that oh, you, you guys haven't watched the way they walked, I <laughs> tweeted out a while. They like no one else walks like them, but they both walk the same way. It's so weird. They walk like guys who have been lifting those since they were like six years old. This is what probably I think has. It is. And what, yeah, I think they have. And that's probably why they're like off injured. They're just like to the gills. Like they they've maxed out their bodies. All right, linebacker Ruben Foster of Alabama and Micah Parsons of Penn State are the two linebackers. And then honorable mentions are Roquan Smith and Isaiah Simmons. Reuben Foster, man. It was awesome. If we're talking about fun to watch. All-time fun to watch team. His tape was the, the, the best in terms of just like all around, the way he saw the game. Incredible. He was like, we let's talk about Paul Dawson. He was like if Paul Dawson was also a very good athlete. Like the guy was just all over the football field. He had a 94.9 run defense grade, highest we've ever seen since last year at Alabama, 89.7 coverage grade. The single highest grade season we've ever seen from a linebacker, just utter dominance. But off field, yeah. Didn't the the Forty Nineers were thinking about drafting him where they drafted Solomon Thomas because that's how talented he was and is. Mm-hmm. And like, if he actually would have not been a piece of shit, could have lived up to that. He had eighty one point two overall grade as a rookie. And he was just, dominant. Now he, he hasn't he hasn't played since twenty eighteen. I remember watching him first watching him when I think he was an underclassman when Rolando McLean was getting drafted. And every single time you turn on the McLean tape, like who the hell is this guy? Because mm-hmm. he was a, a as an underclassman and an insane piece for that Alabama defense. You always knew that he was the next linebacker from Alabama to dominate, and he was going to do that in the NFL. And yeah. obviously, the off field kind of took it away. Yeah, Roquan Smith was also very. He was not nearly as instinctive as Ruben Foster, but like you saw. The movement skills, the speed. He had all that. Isaiah Simmons loved what he could do in coverage. Just too much projection for him in terms of the role he's going to play to put him on the first team here. That's why I think Micah Parsons, like, he played between the tackles. He did things you're going to do at linebacker in the NFL. Feel really good about him, so that's why he makes the team. That's the only, though, not to spoil it, that's the only defensive player from this class that makes any honorable mention, first team, not a lot of defensive talent that's, like, blue chip in this class. Cornerback Jalen Ramsey and Marshawn Lattimore. And then you also have Jeffrey Kuda and Jadavius White. Before you open up here, I talked to Sean Wade recently. That mm-hmm. will play on the Monday episode. They do not call Ohio State DBU. What do they call it? BIA, Best in America. That's what they call it in Ohio State. And he said it started with Marshawn Lattimore, Gary on Conley, and those guys that mm-hmm. like legit laid the groundwork. Oh, I like Gary on Conley. He's really effed up in the NFL. Yeah, Gary on Conley is awesome. And he also had that crazy, he had like that threesome thing or foursome thing that, remember he was like being accused of rape? You don't remember that, why he dropped? He was dropping ahead of that draft class. Yeah, I remember he did drop. It was something along the lines of a threesome, foursome. That, and then like, he didn't drop that far because the Raiders still picked him. No, yeah, he didn't drop far enough. But then that was when Reggie McKenzie says, we've done the homework, we've done the homework, everything's fine, and he ended up getting charges dropped or whatever it was. But um, I don't know why I brought that up. But either way, Marshawn Lattimore, Gary Conley. Gary Conley was awesome. Threesome is a big difference from a foursome, by the way. I know, I know, I know. I just don't remember what it was. Uh, <laughs> But Marshawn Lattimore and Gary Conley have paved the way for guys like Jeffrey Okuda, Damon Arnett, Sean Way, like these like talented yes. quarterback prospects coming out. That was go ahead and kick us sector. off with Ramsey but and Lattimore. Ramsey, you got to go back and watch Ramsey tape when you're like, oh, this guy's you know physical at the line of scrimmage. Go back and watch like Ramsey in college to see what a guy who really 
is physical at the line of scrimmage and a you know NFL caliber press man corner looks like. But he was killing guys, not just always oh, in their hip pockets, staying with them down the field, taking them out of the route completely at the line of scrimmage f- four or five times a game. Just like the guy was off the screen. The guy was not, you couldn't throw his way. And so he he played safety and cornerback there at FSU. That one was like surefire. And then the physical tools, 40 plus inch vertical, 441 at his size. Like he, he had it. Lattimore, only one year as a starter. He had some injury concerns himself, but like, a very similar dude didn't get beat his last year there. He had a 31.9 passer rating allowed uh, that season. It was 2016, his last year at Ohio State. He was, and, and then 4-3, like all the physical tools you could want. Those two were pretty much as good as it gets. And we love Tredavious White coming out. He graded exceptionally well for us. Uh, I think we had him as a top 10 player on our draft board that year. And obviously Okuda remains to be seen whether he does it in the NFL but we talked about all his things. Biggest wingspan of any corner last year. The press man pedigree, that you know, ridiculous broad jump and explosiveness that he had. He, it's gonna the light switch is gonna flip on Flying fans. Don't worry too much about that pick. I agree. Um, all right, let's jump now to slot corner. Minka Fitzpatrick of Bama, and an honorable mention is Byron Murphy, Washington. I love oh, Byron Murphy coming out. Byron Murphy. I still, I still think. think he could be. A good... <laughs> we just did the exact same thing. <laughs> I still think he could be a good still... slot cornerback in the NFL. I mean, his tape was awesome, and he's like a decent athlete. He's not. I mean, his yeah. size is the biggest he, concern. He was. Yeah, it was, he wasn't fast, but he's this change direction drill is great. 5'11", 190. and he was actually good this year when he played the slot. Like, he was a lot better this year as opposed to rookie year when he played a lot more outside. Um, so I still, yeah, we still have faith in him as a slot cornerback. Minka, though, three years, man the slot in Alabama's defense. That was his role. He was not an outside cornerback, not safety. He was a slot. He Great, was exceptionally well every year. Freshman year, sophomore year, junior, dominant. Just like at 184 targets, he won about 56 first downs in his career. And that's just like, that's rare from the slot to see a rate that low. And we're just like, that guy's... He's going to be good in slot. I now, still is he a think, safety? Is he yeah. an outside cornerback? Slot, the slot skill set is far more akin to safety than it is to outside cornerback. And they tried him at outside cornerback as a rookie, and it didn't work out. And then that's why they ended up trading him, I think. Yeah. And so he was frustrated. They were asking him to gain weight to play safety, but then lose weight to play outside corner and all this yeah. crazy shit. He just wanted to play one role. And I still think that if he did didn't play safety, and they asked him to play in the slot, he'd be damn good. But they have Mike yeah. Hilton there. I, I do think that playing safety, he's still very, he's very, very good. Yeah. All right. So. Uh, free safety, Malik Hooker, Ohio State. Honorable mention, Grant Delpit, LSU. This is an interesting one. But but both these guys, I mean, Grant Delpit was hurt last year. But Malik Hooker, I feel like he's been flashy more than he has been consistent. <sighs> Malik Hooker's tape at Ohio State was just awesome. And you still see some of those flashes BIA. in the NFL. Yeah, you do. They just didn't come as frequently. He had seven picks his last year at Ohio State. Some of them were just absurd in nature. He was a 4-3 guy. He was you know, good size, 205, I think, coming out, something like that. Like, he had everything. Has not, like, it, he's been good. He's been a good safety. Towards ACL, uh, towards Achilles this past year, like, injuries have kind of derailed him to a degree. But just... I thought we'd see the next Earl Thomas with Malik Hooker. He's not been the next Earl Thomas, sadly. And Grant Delpit, we're hoping for... Yeah, injuries with these free safeties. Fuck. That sucks. Who do you think the best free safety in the NFL is right now? Oh, shit. Put me on the spot. Jesse Bates, probably. Jesse Bates. Good answer. Good answer. Oh, Quinn. Cincinnati Bengals. <laughs> Good answer. Rise up. All right. Good uh, answer. Good strong answer. safety here, and then we'll jump to Daniel Jeremiah's top 50, and then the interview. Strong safety. This is the easiest one. Not a debate. Sterling James. James. And then Jamal Adams. Yes. These two have been and probably will be the best strong safety prospects we'll see in a long time. Yeah. Derwin, yeah, that could get better than Derwin. True freshman safety led the NFL, led, excuse me, led college football. Highest grade safety in college football is true freshman. One of the highest grades we've still seen at the safety position. Monster. Like he was the most overthought prospect that I can remember over the past like decade of like this guy could have been. I still believe if you want to play him at outside cornerback and just let him do that, he'd be a top five outside cornerback in the NFL. If you wanted him to rush the passer every single play, I think this guy could be a top 10 to 15 edge rusher Jesus. in the NFL. <laughs> if you wanted him to play linebacker, slot cornerback, this guy 
40 plus inch vertical, 220 pounds, like the ideal athlete to do whatever you want. Flip him over to wide receiver if you get some injuries there, Chargers, and he could do that too. I Man. truly believe highest grade as true freshman, highest grade as junior safety in all of college football. Like that one. And he went 17th overall. I still remember when the Packers were on the clock. Pre-draft, everyone's like, he's not going to fall to the Packers. He's not going to fall to the Packers. Falls to the Packers, and I'm like losing my mind. I'm like, oh, my God. It's going to happen. They needed a safety at that point. And they traded back. Still got Jay Alexander. Jay Alexander, great pick. Not going to hate on that draft, but goddamn, Drew went something else. And he has been in the league, just injuries, sadly. All right. I think I remember that was the draft that the Raiders took Colton Miller over <laughs> – Derwin James, yeah. which Colton Miller has gotten a lot better over the past few years. And I think it speaks to like developing offensive tackles with the tools that Colton Miller had. If you can do it, it can pan out. But I would still rather have still Derwin rather James. Have James. All right. Let's jump now to Daniel Jeremiah's top 50. And how we're going to look at this is just the surprises, the surprise names in his top 50. Guys that were surprised at their ranking and where they fit and all that stuff compared to PFF's draft board. Or just um, like anyone else. Notables. Yeah. You know. Notables. The notables. Daniel Jeremiah has Jamar Chase as the number two prospect in the 2021 NFL draft. How is this not Devontae Smith? You're overthinking it. Oh, he's the Heisman. First Heisman since Desmond Howard. We have tweeted out or Instagrammed so much content about Devontae Smith being the number seven prospect or number eight prospect on our board, not the best receiver prospect, and people are losing their goddamn minds. Daniel Jeremiah, former NFL scout, one of the most respected analysts in the draft media, yeah. has Jamar Chase as number two ahead of Devontae Smith for all of the right reasons. And the interesting thing to me is, so he doesn't he doesn't make his board based off of value like we do. Like mm -hmm. we're we're high on quarterbacks, uh, receivers, tackles, yeah. yes. corners. Yeah, like he'll put T.J. Hawkinson as a top five if he thinks T.J. Hawkinson's like he'll put that running level backs high. Prospect. Yeah. So Jamar Chase, then he's just saying like the rarity of him at his position is number two. He's like a more rare, better prospect than Kyle Pitts which I actually disagree with, but like he is high on Jamar Chase to put him at two overall. Obviously, much higher than even we are here at PFF, and we're saying Devontae, he's better than Devontae Smith. Like, And it's difficult for me to disagree. What he did as a true sophomore, I find too many seasons that are even close than in college football history in terms of like production at that age. Against good corners. He went yeah. against Trayvon Diggs, against AJ first and Terrell. Like he went against some legit cornerback talent that year too. Like yeah. at 19 and bullied kids. Absolutely bullied kids. Yeah. So uh calls him a faster Anquan Bolden, which I like because Anquan Bolden is the most overused comp in draft comp history. Every wide receiver that runs over a four six will get the Anquan Bolden comp with bar none. Nikhil Harry got the Anquan Bolden comp. I think Sage Surratt's going to get some Anquan Bolden comps this year. They're not going to be Anquan Bolden because he was a different dude in terms of what he was. Like, he was jacked out of He's his mind. He's one of my favorite players to watch in the yeah. NFL like, in his prime. So, I loved Anquan Bolden. So don't make the Anquan Bolden comp. But, like, with Jamar Chase, faster Anquan Bolden, I'm like, eh. It's only because DJ's kinda doing it. it. You I love DJ. DJ. All right. Uh, the boldest thing on his top 50 is he has Northwestern's offensive tackle, Rashawn Slater, at six, ahead of Panay Sewell, who he has at 10. That, in my opinion, is one of the bolder takes of the 2021 draft class. Like, it is that it is that bold. So, when he tweeted out that initially in the fall that he had Slater over Sewell in terms of, like, tape grades, I was at dinner, and I had to, like, get up and go. Like, I went to the bathroom. I'm like, holy shit, I saw it on my phone. I'm like, I got to go. Like, I got to, like, think about this. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, was that with your last girlfriend? No. Oh. That was, I don't know where I was. Um, but I'm just like, I got to take a second to process this because that's insanity to me. I still went back, you know, have gone back and watched. Still insanity to me. Talked to other people who I respect their opinions about off line play. I could see why you would. He is a more, he is better at playing tackle. Like, how the fuck am I trying to say? Technically. He's technically better at playing tackle. He is not a... Not near the physical, not near the complete prospect in terms of all he brings to the table that Penesul is. No, no one is in the, that we've seen in recent years. So, Penesul at 10 is just, I don't, we're going to have to have DJ on to talk about it. That's we have to. Saying. We have to at this point. He's a friend of the pod. Yeah. Uh, he also has Trey Lance. And we, we've had him on the podcast, I think, earlier in the year. It was earlier, right before Where he season. said he, he was big on Trey Lance. Yeah. Saw him as this potentially. This one's not surprising, yeah. having said 
yeah. sees him potentially better than even Zach Wilson at that point. He has Trey Lance at 11 ahead of Justin Fields at 12. Yes. That was interesting to me. And not surprised because he said, you know, Trey Lance is the most talented of this group. Maybe not the best, but like most talented. It's hard to disagree. Like that arm is, I tweeted out all the longest throws from all the quarterbacks. I love that thread. And his is the most impressive in terms of the zip he gets on it with no wind up. Flat footage, just boom, no effort. 62 yards. It's like he has a cannon. He can run very well. Good size. But just like Justin Fields is, you're not going to convince me he's better than Justin Fields' prospect. Could be better in like three or four years, but like Justin Fields, dude, is very accurate and he has like a strong arm in his own right. Yeah. Like Fields has a good, he has a, he has high level NFL tools. The next we're, one we're hanging have... over high end at that point. It's like, like when you're met the high end threshold already, does it behoove you to go like ten steps, like three, four steps further? I don't think so. Like mm -hmm. you're already at the high end. Like that extra layer of arm strength, it's not going to make you theoretically that extra level of better. How big are his hands? Ooh, we we'll need find to out. get a hand size on here, or else we're we're, we're busts. You know, yeah. the quarterback talent. It's all. About if I see a number that starts size. with an eight, I'm out. It's dead to me. Number twenty three. He has Washington's Levi and Wuzurike, who I thought did not have a good Senior Bowl, and maybe when he published this, I think before the Senior Bowl. Correct. So you think you could? I think you could see in his next update, Levi fall a bit because I, I mean, he was getting dominated by Quinn Miners. Like Quinn Miners was bullying the kid. So Levi might be on his way down, but at twenty three right now, that is a bit of a surprise. So I will say, Wuzurike played out of position a majority of the time at Washington. He played a lot of nose. He's not a nose tackle. He is very athletic. The quote unquote upside that he possesses is more than a lot of defensive tackles in this draft class. But man, he just really hasn't like taken that next step at any point. Like he's graded out fairly well for like, two straight years, but just like never been a consistent impact player at defensive tackle. And it's like he's a redshirt senior now. And then you can kind of forgive the senior bowl because he hadn't played football all fall. And that's just going to be tough going from nothing to live competition like that. But like that was his mo also at Washington was that just like he didn't have the consistency. It would be one splash play and then three plays where it's like that guy's an NFL prospect. So that that's just a very high ranking compared to another uh, really high ranking is having Louisville's Tutu Atwell at thirty one, who we whew. did have on the podcast, and I think does does a lot of things that other receivers in this class can't like he is a freak in his own right, a smaller dude that can be a gadget player with a ton of speed. But at thirty one. Ahead of Rondell Moore, another guy that would be playing a similar role in the NFL, I think that's where I have reservation. It's like, okay, if I'm bringing in a 2-2 two -two Atwell and I know I have to scheme him targets and these things, look at his route map. I tweeted out 2-2 two -two Atwell's route map. I mean, it was digs, slot verticals, and behind the pass stuff, like behind the line of scrimmage stuff. Like, you are not getting a guy that can run all the routes. And I think if you're going to buy into that role, I'd rather have yeah. Rondell. Yeah. The reason you are high on 2-2 two -two Atwell and have him above – guys like Rondo Moore, Elijah Moore, is like those shoe slot guys, is because his 40 starts with a 4.2. Yeah. And there starts with maybe a 4.3. He told me he's been the fastest kid on his team his entire life. And he is. The dude can fucking blaze. But even on like vertical routes, it's not like nuanced. He's kind of just like the dude is sprinting down the yes. football field. And that can like get with you separation With free releases too. With yeah. free releases over the middle of the field and the Louisville quarterback's just throwing it up there but you also have to look at i think the the thing that stood out to me and i think one of the first things you look at when you're looking at a smaller receiving prospect is his catches through contact or even handling contact late in the route like and you see him struggle the catch radius is never going to be there for tutu and i yeah. think again tutu fantastic player all the speed in the world but you're going to have to scheme a role for him and if i'm going to do that for tutu i don't know if i want to do that and pick him 31 i want a guy that can win yeah. in multiple roles in those things all right 39 and i think this could fall too honestly i i I liked what I saw from Aaron Robinson of UCF at the Senior Bowl, but yeah. I still am unconvinced he is the best slot cornerback in this class. Mm -hmm. I don't think he is the slot, best slot cornerback in this class. I'd probably tip my cap to Molden there or even Asante Samuel Jr. So with that being said, I don't know if I want to bring him in as high as 39. That's where Daniel Jeremiah has him on and his I, board. I, I don't think he's a pure slot. Like, I think he can play outside. Yeah, his arms weren't that long, but like the way he plays the position – he he's not like a lot of other slot cornerbacks where it's like they're five foot nine, they're never just gonna hang on the outside. They're five nine, one ninety five. Like that's just not gonna happen on yeah. the outside. I don't think that's the case with Robinson at all. 
but we just never saw it. So if you haven't seen it, you'd feel a little less. Like I think he has the skill set to do it though. The but physicality, also the mentality not, is there though. But yeah, doesn't have great length. I don't think he's exceptionally fast. He's kind of just like solid to me. He's like a late day. He's like a mid late day two guy. You have like, him I think I in the fifties or sixties on yeah. PFS draft board. Um, next one here. And I actually really like Greg Newsom. Greg Newsom here at 40, the Northwestern. I think it's Greg Newsom the second, Northwestern cornerback. I there were a handful of clips that I can't share on Twitter from the All 22 on that Big Ten tape that, like, oh, oh man. Dude, yeah, flex the All 22. Gotta flex the All 22. But there are a handful of clips on there where, like, okay, this guy could break on the ball. Like, he has, I think, some good movement skills, some good yeah. change of direction. I did, there were, there's not a lot of tape of him. That's the, okay, that's what I was going to say with this. This is just. I, I worry about competition he faced. He had only six games this year of like, that's the tape you're going off of. Because last year, he wasn't that good. 59.4 coverage grade uh, last season was not nearly the player he was this past year. And he gets hurt midway through the Ohio State game. That's the only real receiver he played. The other list of the other game, Nebraska, Purdue, I guess David Bell, Purdue, Wisconsin, Michigan State, Illinois. That's that's like you might as well be at BYU with the competition you're playing there if you're in the Big Ten East West. Excuse me. That's that's just not like until he played Ohio State, he really hadn't faced a guy that was legit. And then I guess Ohio State, a lot of off, only a few reps where he's actually trying to stick with the guy one on one. And like, yeah, I like his movement skills. Yeah, I like his size, but it's just we really haven't. I don't think, in my opinion, seen enough that I'm comfortable putting him at forty. But like. It was, He's good. Like I'm not. I'm not hating. I'm mm-hmm. saying he's. That's different. Where is he right now on like PFF sport for you? Sixties on PFF sport. Also, let's. I'll. I'll find it. You. You. You go ahead. I, I think when you bring up the Ohio State receivers, I, I talked to Sean Wade recently, and that's going to play on the Monday episode of Two for One Drafts. And I talked about Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. He's sixty, and um, he said Chris Olave is faster, which I thought was surprising. Garrett Wilson looks like he has some juice, but Chris Olave is faster and can get on you. But he said Garrett Wilson has these catches in practice and this this like freakish like spectacular catchability and like route running that like he says will just blow you away like it, like he is a freak monster at the receiver like he under he a big thing he kept saying was he understands the game very very well and can do all of the things like Chris Olave is a burner and can get on you but Garrett Wilson he talked about Garrett Wilson like he was talking about like Randy Moss I told you I saw one blaze out as a freshman and I'm like I immediately go and look up who that was Garrett Wilson I'm like that guy's going to be awesome. You can't, like, it's a route where it's like, you're either physically capable of that or you're not. Mm-hmm. You don't teach a guy to do that. He has it. He's going to He also had a very good take. I talked to him about Devontae Smith in that matchup. He had a very good take about weight and how much it matters at the receiver position. He kind of scoffed at it. He's like, it doesn't matter. Like, if you are getting open yeah. and getting after the catch, it doesn't matter. It's like, most, he's like, most receivers are small. Like, we, we, like we ask our receivers to play small. Like, you want to be fast and get in and out of your breaks. And I thought how much disdain he had for, like, the weight being a problem, I thought was interesting. There's a lot of good stuff on that weight interview. Um, all right, Patrick Jones at 42. I I, I can't get on board with this. I DJ. think this is going to be the biggest difference Fall. between us and maybe like general public on a prospect. He's 120 something on our board. Oh wow! We're just not. I just don't see it. And like he doesn't even have long arms for an edge rush, 32 inch arms, even though he's like six five. He is. Uh, yeah, in the 120s, I think, on our board. I should find it. But 42, the lowest win rate in the one-on-ones at the Senior Bowl, 135, actually, on our board. It's just like I don't think he's – and as a senior coming out, not necessarily a young prospect like some of the other edges in this draft class. So, like, you're maybe not banking on that next level of development. I, I just – yeah, I, I just – this is going to be the biggest difference between us and probably mass media on a guy. Number 45 here, Marlon Tuipolotu of Utah. He, no, no, USC, sorry. USC. Um, he, I thought, had some splashy or flashy reps at the Senior Bowl, but didn't win consistently, which was a concern. So this one, I'm not, it's not going to be me ha- hating on TJ, but I can guarantee you I know which games he watched this year. Mm-hmm. He watched the Utah game where he had six pressures, and he watched the Arizona State game where he had five run stops and two sacks. He definitely watched those two games to put him at 45 overall because I watched those two games. And I remember texting Eric Galco of uh, Optimum Scouting. I'm like, hey, have you seen this uh, USC DT, Marlon Tui Piloto? I actually like him better than JT Fele, who's getting like this early round hype. Um, but then you go and watch his other tape, and it's not the same. It is not the same as that. Now, 
is he is that what he's capable of or did he just go against two trash bag offense lines hard to say hard to say but he had a 74.9 overall grade on the season he was not that level yeah. of dominance that to us would get a garner a top 50 pick especially at defense stack where it's not necessarily the most valuable position and I even like him. This is kind of like the LJ Collier thing from a few years ago. It's like, I, th- I felt I was high on him, calling him like a top uh, 80 guy on our board. I think it's where he's at. And all of a sudden, like LJ Collier goes in the first round when we had him like 55th on our board, and we were like an outlier having him 55th. That to me is like Marlon Tui Pelotu. It's like, I like him a lot, but 45, I don't see him as the top, as that high on our board. Yeah. I think the other thing too, we've talked to Dale and Jeremiah about his process before, and he mm-hmm. talks about for any prospect, he starts with like, he talks about this process of earning a game, game. or yeah. earning a third game where like you're watching a first game of a prospect. And if he sees it in the first few plays, you'll earn a second game or a third game. And I think it's interesting to think about that because with us and how like we're able to cut up film and stuff, our process is sometimes like watching full seasons of a guy on all of his targets of 10 plus yards and then yeah. watching all of his targets first, like top flight competition. Like it's definitely yeah. an interesting, it's interesting because there are certain positions where you want to watch full game, like quarterback and, and other positions where you want to watch. I full feel games. like also a lot of times you want to watch full games to discern role. Yeah. yeah. But like we can have just the data to be like, here's this role. True. You true. Know? No. Yeah. It, it definitely makes it easier or quicker. Is probably how I'd yeah. phrase it. All right, last two guys here has James Hudson of Cincinnati at 46, which we like Hudson, but is that too high for Hudson? I don't know. I, like I like Hudson him a, lot. a lot, dude. I like Hudson yeah. a lot. He's just, he is raw. Raw. And it's like hard to really go to bat for a guy who's that raw at, does he stick a tackle? Does he go on to guard? He might start a guard early in his career. I'm not sure. But like, it's just hard for me to really go to bat top 50 pick on a guy who might be a guard who's raw. Yeah. And I like him. But 46. I, I think you're I buying think, into that because he is like an interesting athlete. Like a guy that yeah. used to play defensive tackle, was a highly regarded recruit that went to Michigan, transfers to Cincinnati, plays tackle at a high level. Like, he has like legit, it all, if he plays in that yeah. entire Georgia game, I think they win. Like and then the, the backup guy comes in and Aziz Ojulari takes him to takes his lunch. And it's it's not just like a lot of times some people are like, oh, he has the tools and like he's like it's not just that he's explosive and has like good length. He's coordinated. Like, mm-hmm. the way he moves is like an athlete. Like, it's like a guy who started as a defensive lineman. Like, he moves in that way that is necessary to play tackle at a high level. But it's just like, you're going to have to teach him a lot. Yeah. He should have gone to Notre Dame is what I'm trying to say. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Golden Domers, that trash-ass party school. We had a guy yesterday. We did trivia oh, yesterday. <laughs> we, do tri- we did trivia uh, at a local <laughs> pub, and uh, this guy who's like, you know, he's a nice guy, older guy, but he was asking us like where we went to school. He's like, I'm trying to get you know an idea of the competition. You know, what, what were you guys' majors? Where'd you go to school? Yeah. And he said that Notre Dame was a big party school, and you're like, no, it wasn't. I'm like, dude, no. Like, <laughs> I, like, I've been to a lot of college campuses. It's the worst one in terms of party. I mean, why you're still doing 20 Miller Lights on a Saturday at 29, 30 years old is because you this didn't time. get it at Notre Dame. You know, like that's the reason. I think that's why dry January has to happen and maybe why this relation it, it all comes full circle at the yeah. back end of the pod here. It all but, comes full circle. But also the guy tries to join our team. Oh my God. The that guy was comes horrible. over. He's like, he's like, you guys mind if I just hop in? He like starts pulling out a chair. I'm like, I'm like, no man. Dude, that was when you got, <laughs> went into your full, like kick you off my yacht. Cause I'm too <laughs> nice of a guy. If I, if it was just me, I was like, yeah, of course. Even though I hate myself on the inside, but you stood your ground. I'm like, dude, we got a team that comes every week. We're not going to break this. People and go hard in trivia around here. That's something it's I found big. out. There, I, I was at uh, Max, which you guys have been to Max Pete's Pub one time. Yeah. This was way back in college. This chick, uh, because it was too loud, it was like, you know, so it's like kind of a college bar. And they were trying to do trivia. And this, this, I, she she obviously wasn't a student because she was older than everybody there at the time. She Progress. tried to threaten to stab someone. What? Yeah. Uh-huh. She like stood up on the table. She's like, quiet. And she had like a knife. Oh my God. Head. Yeah. So that's remember? that's the level that's the, she didn't know she <laughs> yeah. I mean it, that sounds it, like the chicks I go for I, yeah. I kind of like her it dissolved but I mean that's just a kind of uh, that's like an example of how hard people go for trivia around here and last night's trivia was all music which is horrendous I don't you for don't, those who don't know oh yeah let's open up the personal on me I don't listen to music and here's the backstory when I was in an elementary school I went to an elementary did, school where in did Oakland. music hurt you did, I was did. in elementary school in Oakland. And my parents did not want me to go to an Oakland middle school. So they made me transfer as an interdistrict transfer to a school in like San Leandro, Castro Valley area outside of Oakland while we still lived in Oakland. But if you're an interdistrict transfer, by the way, you have to maintain above a 3.5 to stay. 
Like, or else you have to go back to an Oakland school and you can't get suspended, which was one of the big things. Or uh, obviously, whatever. That's why I was goody two shoes and I had like a 3.9 or whatever. But so I, I go from fifth grade to sixth grade and I have no friends. I don't know anybody. And those are your formative years to learn music and like kind of like music, you know? So the only friend I had, the only guy that would even talk to me was this heavy metal guy. This guy who's like a diehard heavy metal dude. And I was like, you know what? I'll like heavy metal to be friends with this guy because I don't have anybody else. So I got into heavy metal. I was wearing band t-shirts. I had a mohawk in middle school. It was a disaster. I legitimately like formed my personality to the guy, the only person that would talk to me in middle school. And then he ends up moving. He moves my freshman year of high school. And my entire life, I've been faking liking metal. And then I get to ninth grade and I'm like, I don't like any music. I didn't I didn't have the seventh grade Green Day years, you know, or like what, Atrey You and all this random shit that people got into. What is that other band? Chemical Romance or whatever. Yeah, I never me. got it. I ended up, I was like, Iron Maiden's cool. And then my friend leaves, like, I kind of hate this stuff. <laughs> so now I'm in ninth grade and I don't know any music. So either way, I don't know any music. Trivia last night, I was a fish, a dead fish. I could not. I had I don't know any of the songs I don't know any of the artists I I, I was just there there to party yeah, unfortunately um, all right last one here and then we'll get to the interviews I apologize for the length of this pod here last guy is Deo Odiyingbo at fifty the UCLA guy or no no Dame Vanderbilt so, or Vanderbilt no really gold helmets you're just ah uh, the gold helmets threw me off yeah um I'm just so sad he tore his Achilles so we didn't get to see him at the yeah. Senior Bowl he's one of the most versatile defensive linemen in this draft class I, like I. This is one where it's like 50. I wish I could I wish I could put him at 50. I like his tape a lot. That torn ACL, he's at 80 on our board. I, that tore, excuse me, Achilles. That's just he's not gonna play as a rookie. Yeah. That's a tough sell. That's tough. And then you could see like, him come down for DJ too, I think. Yeah. So because this was, I think, before that news broke, right? Been. Yeah. Interesting. All right. That's going to do it, man. I like doing this kind of stuff. I like doing the um, looking at other people's boards and kind of getting the lay of the land of where people stand, you know, because we always talk about not being overconfident in your own evaluation, seeing where other guys see people, I think is important. And um, definitely with like checks and balances. It's what the country is based off of. Checks and balances, baby. Got to have checks and balances. Um, But now let's go ahead and jump to the interviews with Elijah Moore and Charles Snowden. Welcome into Two for One Drafts. Austin Gale here with Ole Miss wide receiver Elijah Moore down there in Arizona, closer to the West Coast than me. I'm a Cali boy stuck in Cincinnati. The weather is absolute garbage here in Cincinnati. What's the weather like in Arizona? How's that treating you? Man, it's hot. It feels like Florida, man. It's treating me good. That's good, dude. I mean, hot is better than – I think it's going to be like 12 degrees this week in Cincinnati. It's not what you like to see. Uh, but you're out there training with Exos, preparing for your eventual pro day there at Ole Miss. What exactly are you working on right now? I, lo- I know it's probably a combination of everything, but are there some specific goals you have for some of the drills? Are you working to get up to a certain weight? I know a lot of guys are eating like crazy right now or trying to cut. Where are you at with your uh, workout training and your preparation for your pro day? Really just trying to eat well. You know, just run fast. You know, that's that's really the main goal. You know, just to get every, everything ordered. Of course, you know, everyone has to come over here and work on everything. But the main goal is just really to run fast. Who are you working out with out there? I know in Pensacola they got a lot of the. Uh, I think I think uh, Tutu Atwell's out in Pensacola. Some other guys. But who who's out there in Exos? Who are you uh, becoming friends with here? Uh, Rashad Bateman, Tariq Black, um, Danami Brown. Just pretty much people I'll be close with. Nice man, Diami Brown. He's got he's 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 got he's got some receiving skills, man. So is Rashad Bateman. Rashad Bateman getting mocked inside the first round. Let's go back to this past season for you. You know, for Ole Miss, you know, he had over 115 targets in 2019, 850 yards and six touchdowns. But really took that yardage total to the next level in 2020. Saw over uh, over nearly 1,200 yards and 91 point uh, uh, 1.2 overall PFF grade. A little bit of a jump going from 2019 to 2020, what do you think went into that, not necessarily a breakout, but that step forward for you at Ole Miss this past season? Well, let me be completely honest. I really felt like it was without having classes. We had more time. I, I had more time specifically to get right, you know, with all my football stuff, you know, to lock in, take it to a whole, a whole other level and just really tap into all everything I was bad at. So really just that, that part, you know, Focusing on, on the you know on the plays and everything, and then on on top of that, just getting closer with God. Those are the two main things that I, I can just say has really just helped me, you know, clear mental and just be able to focus on football. 
That's, I mean, you're going to see a lot more of that in the NFL too. I know a lot of, when I talk to draft prospects, one of the biggest things they look forward to is commit, you know, 100% committing to their craft, no longer working at, you know, algebra 101 or any of that stuff. You're actually committing to football and all of those things. So when you talk about focusing on what you were bad at and trying to improve there, I know you, you, your drop count went from six to two, which is obviously an improvement, added five more forced missed tackles after the catch. What specifically did you work on this season that you felt you were bad at, that you felt like you had opportunities to improve on? Really just little small things, but just for an overview of, uh, you know, just to break it down, really just, you know, small things like run, running through the catch and, you know, working on top of the routes, focusing on the ball, you know, just playing bigger than what I am. It's just small, small things. Everybody has things to work on, but mm -hmm. you got to pick everything that, that you're bad on and try to elevate, you know, so th things is like kind of like that. I, I want to bring up a specific matchup, and you went against a whole host of really talented, you know, cornerbacks or defensive backs playing in in the SEC, but specifically South Carolina. You know, you had an opportunity. I think you were shadowed on a mo bulk majority of your routes by another really talented cornerback prospect in this class, and J.C. Horn. But took him for 13 receptions, 225, and two touchdowns in that game. Really stepped up against like NFL caliber competition. And as often as you played in the slot. You know, you see a ton of free releases. You see some levels of schemed production coming underneath. But against J.C. Horn, that was toe-to-toe. -to -toe. That was a boxing match against South Carolina. Talk to me about that matchup and, and, and what you did to kind of get open against J.C. Horn and that South Carolina defense. Well, kind of went against him my freshman year, too. And I kind of just, you know, went back over to film and tried to watch tendencies and everything. But, you know, he's a, he's a really good corner. You know, he grew. He got, like, he probably had like three more inches, like six, two, six, three now. So I knew, you know, he had long, longer arms. So just trying to use things to my advantage, you know, you know what I'm saying? Trying to stay away from him, trying to, you know, slap his hands down whenever he would shoot. Um, but he's a great athlete overall. So just going into it, you know, I had to be ready. So. How much film are you watching in a given game week on your opponent? And when you, when you speak to looking for tendencies, what exactly are you looking for in opposing defensive backs to kind of get an edge on them through watching game film? I'm going to be completely honest with you. Um, of course, I watch like film on other players, but I really watch them more on myself. Oh, you know, wow. I, but like, if you go into a game 100% clear mind, knowing that, you know, you're, you know, that your assignment is going to be ex executed at the highest level that, you know, no one can't do anything. I really feel like this year I went to every game, just whatever answer someone thought they had, I had another answer. So, I really just watch more film on myself. So. That's that's awesome, man. I, I, you don't hear that often. Honestly, a lot of people spend time on their opposition, but I always bring up after, too, it's like how much are you watching yourself to improve on your own tape? I know uh, a handful of prospects that do that. Um, specific, I wanted to bring up, you know, you brought this up a little bit. You know, J.C. Horn, add some inches, bigger guys. Something that's going to be a challenge for you is going against bigger corners in the NFL. 5'9", 185 is what you're listed at. I'm sure you're working towards other weights. But what do you have to do, you know, speaking of watching film on yourself and doing other things, to beat bigger corners, to to let people know that size doesn't matter for you when you're trying to create separation? I Really, just the small things, you know. I think football is more of a, a, te a technique and running routes type of game, you know what I'm saying? So... You know, being fast, of course, play, plays into it. But I, I really just feel like if you just outwork and just outthink your opponent, you know, by scheme and just by what you know, you're going to get open and win at all at all times. And on a, a, adding on to that, I feel like football is just a confidence level. You know, if you have someone's confidence and feel like you can't be stopped, like, that's really going to happen. So confidence is everything, man. You don't have confidence. You're thinking on the field. You're not reacting. And you really do. I, I agree with that 100%. Uh, I want to I turn the clocks back a little bit. And look at that 2018 season you spent with DK Metcalf and AJ Brown. You know, you had 37 receptions for 407 and two touchdowns in that season. But I'm sure so much of the learning took place with those guys in the locker. I mean, even Demarcus Lodge, another talented receiver there at Ole Miss. How much did you take away from that season and from AJ Brown's game, from DK Metcalf's game? Did you implement into your own in future seasons? I Man, it's really crazy because as soon as I touched down on campus, it's like, and boys is like, come on, let's go work out. So, and they weren't, you know, they were leading college football. So they didn't have the man, the mentality of like, oh, who is this kid? He thinks he's better than everybody else. Like, they was like, teach me everything, you know, and we gonna all share I, like ideas. And even to move it towards practice, man, practice, that was probably one of my funnest years of practice in general because you know, the, you know, the competitive aspect that was going on was just crazy. You know, AJ would take a slant to the, to the career of DK would, 
up up ball somebody allowed to make a toe tap catch and we we'll just all go back and forth and like it'll just motivate everybody to kill somebody so being having them on my team and picking parts of their brain was really just a plus one for me so i'm just grateful man i, I can't imagine being in that same receiving room it's just so much talent are you at all surprised at just how quickly i'm sure you're not but i mean i have to ask the question are you at all surprised at how quickly aj brown and dk metcalf have you know presented themselves as two of the top receivers in the nfl i mean and these guys weren't even drafted highly you know they second round for aj brown dk metcalf went later they have hit the NFL by storm, and I'm sure you're not, but I have to ask, are you even surprised at all? No, I'm going to be honest. Like, if you came in seeing the things that I've seen, how hard they work, like, you'll think they're superheroes. Like, I'm not just saying that. I'm not just trying to you – know, I know you guys see the picture and everything, but them boys work hard, you know. Like, not like everybody works. Like, they work harder. You know, I, I used to see DK run sleds right after we ran sprints. I used to see AJ go lift. Man. Right after we had a big, a big bench lift. Like, things that people don't do. They do. So I'm, I'm not surprised for any of their success. You know, they, they, they deserve the world. I, I wanted to finish this by talking about Ole Miss a little bit. In the future, you know, get some Ole Miss fans happy about next season. I know you won't be there, but there's a very talented quarterback there, former four-star recruit from California, Matt Corral, who had a really good season in his own right in 2020, one of the highest-ranked quarterbacks returning to college football. Tell Rebels fans and other draft fans for Corral in future years what they're getting from Matt Corral in 2021 and what type of quarterback he brings to Ole Miss? Man, you really just going to get a hard edge, someone who's locked in, who's getting close to a guy. And to be honest, in my opinion, like that's going to be the best quarterback in college football. He's going to make everybody work, work hard. He's going to work hard. He's going to stay the extra. He's going to do everything that he's he, he's supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? He he lives by the by the book, man. And I just couldn't be more, more proud of him. Heisman talk. Trust. Love it. Love it. That's awesome, man. Elijah, I really appreciate the time, and I wish you the best of luck working out in Arizona and as this draft process, which I know is going to be virtual, Zoom interviews, all this crazy shit, but I'm sure it'll be a fun process nonetheless. And like I said, best of luck moving forward. Thank you. I appreciate you. <sighs> Joining the 2 for 1 Drafts podcast is none other than former Virginia edge defender, kind of a chess piece, man. I, I put, I could say edge defender, but you played played some off-ball. You did a lot of different things. Charles Snowden, who's now in Pensacola working with Exos there. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, thank you. How you doing? Doing good, man. I, I appreciate it. We talked a little bit before recording. You got the Chiefs this weekend in the Super Bowl. I'm also riding with the Chiefs. You don't want to not be rooting for Patrick Mahomes. That's the whole thing. You know, like, you want to go into Sunday drinking beers, eating food, whatever it may be. Maybe not you. I know you're on the diet, whatever it may be, but I'll be drinking some <laughs> beers, uh, watching Pat Mahomes cook for sure. Let's start with the most recent we've seen you is at the Senior Bowl. And I, th- I know you got a ton of rave reviews for being – for lack of a better word, good, a great cheerleader on the sideline because you were caught in a walking boot. You hurt your foot, I think, against Abilene Christian earlier in the season, still battling back from that injury. How was the Senior Bowl experience for you, though, knowing that you couldn't participate in practices, couldn't play in the game, but still around those guys and around those coaches? For me, um, it was interesting. Like, it was one, it was great to be around, like, top guys. Um, it, was inter- it was fun because, like, some dudes, like, I've been playing against them for four years now, and so, like, I don't really know them beyond the helmet. So it's nice to kind of get to know those guys off the field and kind of just, like, exchange stories, stuff like that. But then uh, when it came down to practice time, like, it didn't hit me how tough it would be not being able to play until I was there on the practice field. Guys are warming up, and I'm like, I can't do anything. Like, it really <laughs> – like, it, it really hit home, and it just – and that part was tough. So I just try to stay as involved as possible, like – handing out water, cheering guys on. I didn't want to, like, come on, guys, work harder because, like, no one wants to hear that from the injured kid. So I just <laughs> try to be the best teammate cheerleader I could be. Yeah, and that's it must have been an interesting position for you because, I mean, you've played a ton of snaps over your collegiate career, played in over 700 snaps in 2018 and 2019, and then obviously had the injury in what was technically week 12 of this weird college football season in 2020 and then missed some snaps after that. So it must have been weird for you to be the injured guy in that situation. Did you still, however, have an opportunity to talk with a lot of the coaches down there and a lot of the scouts down there? Would you meet with some teams? or How, how did that part of the uh, the week go for you? Yeah, so um, I – uh, talked a lot and got close with the um, Panthers coaching staff. And so that was cool to kind of still be coached by NFL coaching staff, see how the practices are run. Um, and so, uh, like, me and the defensive coordinator coach, you know, we had a really long conversation the day of the game, actually. And it was really eye-opening, and I appreciated that. And then um, the way the Senior Bowl was ran, like, this year, um, especially with the combine being canceled and everything, they set it up. So you met with all 32 teams in 15-minute intervals. So it was like speed oh my dating, God. NFL version. 
And That's so insane. it started, it was insane. So it started at 7.30. You met with 16 teams. You had one 15 minute break at some point throughout that. And it was literally like speed dating. And then I felt like I, I recited the same stories 32 <laughs> times in a row. But um, it was just great to have the opportunity because like, you're not going to find that much else during this process. I need some examples of some of these questions they're asking you in a speed round, you know, because I feel like they're probably the same few questions. But what are some of the examples of what teams are asking you in that situation? Oh, 100 percent. So like the same questions that were asked were growing up, who raised you, who did you live with, high school recruiting, what was that like? Um, why do you love football? What parts do you love? What parts do you hate about football? What was your weight progression at Virginia? Um, where do you see yourself best at? Give me an example of adversity, how you overcame it. Give me an example of your leadership style, how'd you lead. Uh, just those same type questions, just over and over and over. My goodness. And are those, are you talking with scouts there? Is it some positional coaches? What, what personnel are you talking to with those teams? So independent team to team, like some, like the Steelers, they had their GM there. And then uh, other teams, they just had like one single scout there. And so it, gotcha. it varied team to team. Interesting, man. Well, I want to hear some answers to those questions. I think the, the one that stands out to me is your weight progression, because let's be honest, you have a very interesting frame to play football in. You know, I think the comp and PFF's draft guide is Kawhi Leonard. Like you're six, nearly six foot seven, 230, 240 pounds and better built, not better built, but built really well to play basketball. Did you play basketball in high school, by the way? I need to know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that was I mean, high school, I mean, basketball is my first love. Uh, I grew up loving basketball. I um, I transferred high schools and or in in the dreams, pursuing the dream of getting a basketball scholarship. And so I had two scholarship offers coming out of high school, um, one from St. Francis, Pennsylvania, and then Florida Gulf Coast offered me after I committed to University of Virginia. Interesting, man. That's that's awesome. So what, what has your weight progression been like? Because you've always been this longer, lanky guy. Have you been adding on weight consistently? Have you tried to stay yeah. put at a certain weight? I'm interested to know what your weight progression is. Definitely. So I came into Virginia like a buck 95. And so uh, Holy. Ended up playing, yeah, <laughs> that's insane. I, so I ended up playing my freshman year at like 205, 200 pounds. And then uh, second year, I was 225. Third year, I was 235. And then um, this past summer, I hit 247. That was the heaviest I'd ever been. And then uh, we had like eight week fall camp because of COVID. And so I ended up playing the season around 240. And is that the weight you want to play at in the NFL? Has team have teams given you any feedback on where they want you to play in the NFL? Yeah, definitely. They've said um, just definitely north of two forty five. And so, I mean, I, I when I was two forty seven this summer, I felt very comfortable running, jumping. I felt explosive as, as I'd been. We had a new D line coach come in, and he was like, "Why?" He told the, he told my position coach like, "Wow, like Charles is moving better now than he seemed to on film that I'd watched previously." So um, I said, I definitely think I can hold 255, 260 very comfortably. And so um, that's just kind of like my target. You know, what that tells me when teams are you know telling you to kind of get up to 245, 250 is that they want you to play along the defensive line. Because I've talked to off-ball linebacker prospects that they telling them to go down to 215. Like I remember talking to Drew Tranquil out of Notre Dame and them telling him, yeah, it's OK. You can play at 215. You can play at 220. But if you're going to get to that 245, 250 range, likely they're looking to play you along the edge as a, you know, a stand up edge defender or even with your hand in the ground. Is that where you see your best position in the NFL? Yeah, I think that um, having such a tall, lanky frame, like that my 245 isn't like a traditional 245. It's not as deep, mm -hmm. it's more kind of lean, so I can play off the ball. I can play in space, dropping in coverage, checking tight ends, running backs, stuff like that. And so um, I think that at 245, like the, talking to the Vikings, like an example they gave was Anthony Barr. He plays their 4-3 Sam Backer off the ball, and he's 6'4", 245. And so I think there are teams that, that see me in that mold as well. Yeah, that's an interesting comparison because Anthony Barr at UCLA played along the edge and then they had him take it off ball. So maybe that is a similar frame. He's not quite as tall as you. You're you're an interesting, interesting yeah. breed in that <laughs> regard, but he is a taller linebacker. Uh, let's talk more about you know, your time at Virginia and specifically your work in game weeks. I always like to talk to specifically, especially edge defenders, guys that are working against offensive tackles every single week, how much film they watch, how much film do they watch on their opposition? How much film do they watch on themselves? Because I do think it's a bit of a chess match. It, it is not as simple as just being the man in front of him in front of you. You need to win with technique. You need to win with certain moves. How much film are you watching in a game week? And what exactly are you looking for when you're going up against a certain offensive line or certain offensive tackle? Oh, hundred percent. So like in a game, so like preparing for another team, I always, look to, I always like to look at their starting two tackles. And then, I mean, almost every team has like a third, like a six man off the bench mm -hmm. tackle that'll come in and relieve uh, the left or right tackle. And, um, and so I always look at, you got to look at one, their feet pre-snap. 
So a lot of tackles, if, they're, if it's a run play, they'll be leaning forward, have their hand in the dirt, and that tells me immediately, all right, they're running the football. Or I'll look at their tight end. And so a lot of things, if you look at the depth of their tight end, if they're kind of crowding the tackle, then I know it's, they're going to look at a down block and it's going to be a run. And just like small keys like that tell me what I need to adjust for a run or a pass immediately. And so then after that, you have tackles that like to wait, that are patient with their hands, and they wait for you to shoot their hand, wait for you to shoot your hand so they can kind of just maul you and grab you. And then you have other tackles that like to quick set, get on you quick. You have tackles that are a little light, so I know they've been bull rushed all season. I know some tackles struggle with two-hand swipes and dips. And so just looking at stuff like that, seeing which way they like to slide their protection to the field, to the boundary, to the running back, away from the running back, how much screen are they running? And so it's just like small stuff like that that'll just it could be the difference between fourth down and the first down. And, and then in the offseason, are you turning on the tape for yourself or even like NFL players? I know a lot of guys will watch themselves and then watch NFL players that are doing the moves well already to try and build to your pass rush move list or build to your tool belt, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, uh, I, it's a lot more of myself just reflecting, seeing where I need to improve. Uh, I mean, I watch every game like the next day after it happens, then the next day after that. But it's just honing, like there might be a minor detail that I didn't pick up or something that I did pick up that I kind of forgot about that I need to revisit. And so stuff like that is just, just honing in and uh, mastering that going into the next year. You know, a couple of players I wanted to bring up that I know you've played with in the past at Virginia, two defensive backs. And I know one, Bryce Hall was a big leader at Virginia. And I know it was brutal to see him not be able to suit up in what I think was the bowl game last year. And like watching him on crutches, you could tell. And I've had conversations with him about how, how much of a humble dude that is, a big leader. But also another defensive back you've had an opportunity to play with there at Virginia is Juan Thornhill, a guy who's having success, going to be playing in Kansas City or with Kansas City in the Super Bowl this week. Let's start with Bryce Hall. Talk to me about Bryce Hall off the field, because I think everyone saw what he brought to the table on the field. Former three-star, film junkie that just won with his hands, won with his length, all those things. But off the field, I know an absolute leader in, uh, in, uh, through and through. Yeah, Bryce is just one of the most genuine, innocent dudes you'll meet. Like, he is just happy to be there, happy to be talking to you. He's extremely religious, um, and so he always – is looking to teach guys like he got uh, he himself baptized a few guys on our team encouraged wow. a few guys to get baptized yeah and so he's just very to himself um he's just huge lead by example like Bryce Hall is doing the right thing at the right time all the time and he wasn't like that initially like when he first got to Virginia they always tell us a story like within the first summer he got three strikes we have a strike system so you know like it's supposed to be three strikes in your route but he um I mean he was constantly messing up and so he kind of just had an epiphany, got his life together, got on the straight and narrow. And uh, I mean, he's just nice as can be. Man, I, I, you see that on the field in his play, too. And the conversations I've had with him, he, he's a spectacular player. Now, let's talk some Juan Thornhill here. What are you expecting to see from your former teammate here against the Tampa Bay Bucks in the Super Bowl? Um, I'm expecting to see Juan Thornhill be Juan Thornhill. I'm expecting to see him fly around the field, make plays, have fun, you know what I'm saying? Talk a little smack like he does. And, um, I mean, Juan is an athletic freak. He's the most athletic person I think I've ever been around, either him or Jordan Mack. Like, and so um, as he's just getting back healthy and healthy, like, I mean, the sky's the limit for that guy. Back, back to you, and you're an athletic freak in your own right with a crazy size athleticism combination. I know that injury is going to keep you from Virginia's pro day in March, but the plan is either with Exos or even by yourself with your agency to put a video out of your athletic testing. Are you setting any benchmarks for certain drills, 40 time? I know vert and broad is huge for explosiveness. I'm interested to know if you have any goals in mind, any numbers in mind. Um, I haven't yet, but I'm a huge like goal-oriented guy. Like I love to sit down and work for x all right this like i just see my goals every day like every before every season i'll set tackles sacks tfl's goals stuff like that and so um as i am back healthy and can now like once i'll be able to be able to jump be able to do the five ten five stuff like that then i will look at all right these are the numbers in the past this is where i am right now and these are the goals i want to set for myself so training right now for you, because you're not able to do any of those things, is a lot of that film? Is it a lot of that just conversations with people there at Exos? I'm interested to know like what exactly you're working on now. I'm sure it's just eating, right? Yeah. You're probably trying to eat a ton too, <laughs> trying to gain yeah, that weight. I'm always eating, always eating, <laughs> always getting shakes, hydrating, stuff like that. But um, now that I'm out the boot, uh, and I mean, I would take the boot off almost every, every day to rehab, do movement stuff. Um, and just, but right now the biggest focus is just like, training and strengthening uh, the fundamentals of like running, explosiveness, jumping. So that's a lot of the hips, core, hamstrings, quads, stuff like that. And so 
on upper body, obviously. I do bench press prep every other day, do that with the main group. And so um, that's just kind of the biggest thing for me. To close this things out, I want I want to circle back to the speed dating with the NFL teams and ask that question. You probably said a thousand times, but why do you love the game of football? For me, I love the game of football because one, I love making plays on the field, like sacking the quarterback, knocking the tight end back, shedding the tight end, and tackling the running back in the backfield, getting your hands on the balls, getting interception. Like there is nothing more fun than that. You worked all year for that, and that's one I love. That two, the camaraderie that comes with football, like. At the Senior Bowl, guys are lining up, met two days ago, lining up, trying to knock the other's head off. And then as soon as the day is over, dapping each other up, respect. Like that bond, that camaraderie, that you don't get that in any other sport. I played every sport in my life. You don't get that anywhere else other than football. And then finally, like, like Austin, you and I can go sign up for a five-on-five men's basketball league right now. We can go sign up for a slow-pitch softball league. We can go set up, line up a volleyball league. Like, But football... Like there is no, you can do flag football leagues as at well, all, but there is no other time other than now to play football. And so that urgency, that like, I don't know this word, finality of mm-hmm. it, like you don't get that anywhere else. And so like, it, it just increases my appreciation for the game. That's fantastic, man. I've never heard people speak to, I'll use your word, finality of football, but it's so true. Like you can't get 11 guys or 22 guys in pads at any no. point in time. You know, you Never. can go to your local 24-hour fitness or Crunch, LA Fitness, whatever, and get a game of five. I'm happy to play with you, man. If that was an invite, sure, I'm just going to have to play. <laughs> I'm going to play down low. You run the point. We'll figure it out. No, but that's that's awesome, man. I, I think you're 100% right because once you stop playing, whether you stop in high school, you stop in college, or stop after the NFL – there's no picking it back up, you know, because no. you're not going to find another time where that sport, that organized sport is actually put together successfully. So I, I respect that, man. It's a trained answer. I know you've told all 32 teams that, but I'll take it, man. It, it, it hit good with me. Uh, I really appreciate the time, Charles, and uh, definitely look forward to kind of seeing you throughout this process as we get close to the draft. Maybe we'll bring you on uh, shortly after your pro day or whenever you put out that video. But again, best of luck moving forward and really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me. <sighs> man. For initial takeaways from those, Charles Snowden, brilliant dude. I mean, the guy is very, very smart, and I have full confidence that he's going to be very coachable at the next level. And for a guy that's like 6'6", 240, or trying to get to 245, 250, if you want him to do four different things for your defense or even play special teams, I think he can learn very quickly. And I was impressed with how smart that guy was. And I'm excited, you know, him saying what he said about the Vikings telling him that he could play potentially an Anthony Barr role at the next level. I think that makes the most sense for him at his peak, if he can develop into that tier. And then as for Elijah Moore, stud, I love how he talked about those Ole Miss guys, dude. Ole Miss is family, okay? DK Metcalf, A.J. Brown, Matt Corral. um, He had had a lot of good things to say about those guys. An interesting player in his own right. My brother raves about Oxford. He says it's awesome. He lives down in Jackson, Mississippi now. Oh, nice. So Oxford's dope town. I've only been to Biloxi, Mississippi. Mississippi's which is, not great, too. Jackson, Bilo- <laughs> Jackson might be the worst city I've ever been. Biloxi, Mississippi's tagline Sorry, is the sense. city of discovery. I don't know if you know that. If you want mm. to get down there, let me know. Discover um, yourself. That's going to do it for this version of the podcast. Tomorrow we have the mailbag. If you want your question answered in the mailbag, and we have some backloaded here, but if you want your question answered in a future mailbag, please leave a five-star review on Apple and ask your question there. And if you do that and send me a screenshot of it, I'm giving away draft guides. I gave away like 50 yesterday. We're getting so many reviews, so many people coming in. Appreciate the support, 4241 Drafts. Leave a review and we're going to get you. We're going to get you a draft guide. 50% of all the DMs I get are getting a draft guide. So definitely do that. And uh, tune in next time. Austin Gale, Mike Quinn, Mike Renner, 241 Drafts.